Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnson and welcome to lecture four for advanced linear algebra. Today, we're gonna to be talking about linear dependence and independence. Roughly speaking, the idea behind dependence and independence is we wanna capture the notion of a set of vectors containing redundancies or not containing any redundancies. Okay, so remember back to last lecture when we talked about the span of a set of vectors and we talked about this idea that if you have, say, a, pl a, pl a two-dimensional plane in three-dimensional space, well, you can span that plane by taking just two vectors, right? You just pick any two vectors that are not collinear on that plane and then the span of them is the whole plane. So in a sense, you can describe that plane via just those two vectors. Well, you could also describe that plane be via, say, five vectors, right? You could just pick any five vectors, as long as they're not all collinear on that plane, then the plane is still gonna be the span of those five vectors. But this seems somehow kind of silly. It seems redundant, right? You don't need to use five vectors to describe a plane. It suffices to just use two. Okay, and that's the idea that dependence and independence is going to get at. It's going to get at this idea that, you know, well, five vectors, yeah, it works, but there's some redundancies there. You could throw away some of those vectors and the span's still going to be the same. Okay, so that's the idea here. And the way that we formalize this mathematically is, well, via this linear combination here. Okay, so um, what we do is we say that we've got a set of vectors B in a vector space. Um, we say that this set B is linearly dependent, in other words, it contains redundancies if there's some linear combination of the vectors in that set that equals the zero vector. So if there's some way of taking a linear combination of those vectors in B and getting the zero vector as a result, that's linearly dependent, that's it contains redundancies. Okay, and if there's no way to do this, if there's no non-zero linear combination that gets you the zero vector, then we call it linearly independent. And in that case, we think of it as not containing any redundancies. In a sense, all the vectors really point in different directions from each other. They each give us a new dimension in a sense. Okay, so there are a bunch of notes that I wanna make on linear dependence and independence before we go to any examples. Um, the first of which is that a set being linearly independent, well, that's actually equivalent. Uh, the, the way that you check this is I mean, just via setting up a linear system, what you do is you set up this linear system over here, you set up this linear combination that's just straight from the definition of linear dependence and independence, and the set's linearly independent if this linear system here only has one solution, if the unique solution is just the all zeros solution, right? Here, the, the coefficients in the linear combination that are the variables in the linear system. You solve that linear system. If you only find this solution, then great, you know it's independent. On the other hand, maybe you find infinitely many solutions then it's dependent, okay? Then there is some non-zero linear combination that gives you the zero vector. Okay, and another really important point is that an, we, we could have defined dependence and independence in a slightly different way. We could have said that a set of vectors is linearly dependent if and only if there's a particular vector, if there's at least one vector in that set that's a linear combination of all of the other vectors in the set, okay? So this definition that we gave up here, it's sort of a, it, it, it's a version of this definition down here that doesn't care about any one particular vector. The way that you sort of bridge between these two definitions is like, if you start with this definition up here, well, because at least one of these scalars is non-zero, you can always move one of these terms over to the other side and solve for that vector, right? At least one of the Cj's is non-zero, you move it to the other side, solve for Vj, and you'll, you'll get Vj as a linear combination of the other vectors. So that's another equivalent way of defining linear dependence, as if you can write at least one of the vectors in the set as a linear combination of the other ones. Okay, and again, that comes, that sort of highlights this idea that you know, the set, if it's linearly dependent, then, there, then there's a redundancy. There's some, sort of some vector in that set that doesn't give us really a new direction because it's just a combination of all the other vectors in there, okay? There's sort of nothing new about it. Okay, and there's one final note that I wanna make about dependence and independence before we do some examples, and that is if you have a set containing just two vectors, then it's really easy to determine whether the set's dependent or independent. It's dependent if and only if the vectors are multiples of each other, and it's independent otherwise. It's independent if they're not multiples of each other. And the reason for this is, well, again, you're just asking, is there one vector in the set that's a linear combination of all the other vectors in the set? Well, if there's only two vectors in the set, you're just asking, well, is this guy a linear combination of the other guy? In other words, is this guy a scalar multiple of this guy, right? Linear combination of just one vector, all you can do is scalar multiplication. Okay, so let's do a couple examples to see how we can determine 
you know, whether a set's dependent or independent. So let's start off with just a set of two vectors. And in this case, the vectors are polynomials, polynomials of degree two. Okay. And we want to know, is this set here dependent or independent? And well, we just use that uh, sort of test that I just mentioned. We, we look at these two vectors. Are they multiples of each other? No, they're not. They're not multiples of each other. So we know right away that set is linearly independent. Okay. In other words, there's no redundancies here. These vectors really point in different directions. Like maybe we don't have great geometric intuition for this space here, but that's sort of the idea here. They're pointing in different directions. They're not, they're not just multiples of each other. Okay. So sets with two vectors are easy. Let's go up to a set with three vectors. Okay, so in this case, the vectors happen to be matrices. Is this set linearly dependent or independent? Okay, so this time we don't have sort of a quick and easy check. We've actually got to set up a linear system. And what you do is you set up exactly the linear system from the definition of de dependence and independence. C1 times one vector from the set plus C2 times another vector from the set plus C3 times another vector from the set. Set that equal to zero. And the question is, is the only solution to this linear system the all zero solution? Okay, and again, we, we set up linear systems based on matrices back when we were talking about, uh, you know, spans. Um, so here, the idea is very, very much the same, okay? It's just, you know, look at each of the entries. Each of the entries in the matrices give you a linear equation, okay? So looking at the top left entries, 3C1 plus 2C2 plus 0C3 equals 0. So that's at my first equation from the top left. In the bottom left, I get 2C1 plus 0C2 plus 1C3 equals 0. So that's that equation. And similarly, you get two other equations from the top right and bottom right. Okay, so you get four equations and three unknowns, and you just go through and you solve that linear system using Gaussian elimination. And you're going to find that for this particular linear system, this linear system right here, there is only the zero solution, okay? Yeah, you really, the only way that you can satisfy all these equations simultaneously is really if C1, C2, and C3 are all equal to zero, okay? So that tells us that this setup here really is linearly independent. The only linear combination of them that equals zero is the all zeros linear combination. So it's a linearly independent set. In other words, all those matrices, yeah, they really point in different, you know, directions, even though we, again, we don't quite have a great geometric sense of what, the space of matrices looks like, but that's the idea. Okay, now let's do one more example, but this time with the vector space of functions. So remember, that's what that funky script F over here means, the vector space of functions. So we've got this set here, sine squared, cos squared, and cos 2x, and we're asking again, is that a linearly dependent or independent set? So we start off the exact same way that we always do, c1 sine squared plus c2 cos squared plus c3 cos 2x, and we set that equal to zero, and we're asking the question, does that imply that c1, c2, and c3 are all equal to zero? Is that the only solution? Okay. So the way that we're going to tackle this problem is a little bit different than the previous ones because these three functions up here, they're all trig functions. And we remember that, hey, we know all sorts of trig identities from way back in the day. We learned these in previous courses. And in particular, we, we remember that there's a trig function relating cos 2x to these two functions, sine squared and cos squared. In particular, cos 2x just equals cos squared minus sine squared. Okay, And that's exactly the type of thing that we want because we can rearrange this equation. If we just move everything over to the left-hand side, then we're gonna get sine squared minus cos squared plus cos 2x equals the zero function, okay? And this equation here, once we've moved everything over to the, to the left-hand side, is exactly an equation of this type with particular scalars chosen. In particular, with c1 equals one, c2 equals minus one, and c3 equals one, this equation is exactly this equation. So that tells us that no, this set is not linearly independent because C1, C2, and C3 don't all have to equal zero, right? They could equal one, minus one, and one. They could also equal two, minus two, and two. They could equal any multiple of these three scalars here, but we found at least one non-zero solution that works. That's the important point. So that tells us this set is linearly dependent. Okay, in other words, this set here, there's sort of redundancies in it. One of these functions, one of these vectors can be built out of the other ones using just our vector space operations, using just scalar multiplication and vector addition. And in particular, this is how you do it via this trig identity. You just take cos squared and you subtract sine squared and you get this function over here. So there's a redundancy there. There's sort of nothing new when you introduce this third function here. Okay, so that's why it's linearly dependent. 
Okay, so that basically does it for this week. Next week, we're going to combine these ideas and start talking about bases of arbitrary vector spaces, and we'll see sort of what made this final example uh, a little bit different in flavor than the previous examples. The, the basic idea is that this vector space F, it doesn't have a nice basis for us to work with, so it's, it's a little bit trickier to turn this linear independence equation here into a system of linear equations. So this vector space is somehow, it's more exotic than the other ones that we've been looking at, like polynomials and matrices and and Rn. Okay, so I will see you then.